Every, every single time I use this wireless microphone, Cody says, hey, turn the microphone on, wait about five seconds and start talking. If you start talking before that, or if you don't turn the microphone on, you're not going to, nobody's going to hear you. And every time, I did it last service too, every time I don't turn the microphone on, I get up here and I go like this. <laughs> and nobody can hear me. And I don't know why for a split second. But... I am TJ. I'm the youth pastor here at the Way Church. Uh, now I'm, I'm full-time here at the Way Church. Uh, gave up my old life. If you guys didn't see, that train parked and through Sepulpa. That was me. I just got off and walked away <laughs> one day. Um, I was going to, but Lindsay wouldn't let me. It was, she said, no, you gotta, you got to be nice. But I have the honor, the privilege of speaking to you guys this day, the, the first day of 2020, uh, the first day of this year, or this decade, um, which that means that T.J. Caldwell is setting the tone for a year, for a decade, T.J. Caldwell. <laughs> That's no big deal. It is a big deal. I might throw up. It's a lot of pressure. Uh, if you, you know, interact with me at all, you know that's, really, TJ? <laughs> he's he's going to be the, you know, the guiding marker now. Oh, but t- seriously, I, I love this part of the year. I love the new year because uh, I get to hide my bulk in hoodies and stuff like that. And, uh, and it's, it's the new year. So, so December 31st doesn't matter anymore. All that matters is 2020. All that matters is this year. Because this year, you know, is going to be different. Uh, new year, new me, right? Uh, it sounds corny, but you, it's, this is a year of new beginnings. This is, this is the year. We get a blank slate. We get a fresh start. Uh, and it's exciting. I, I love it. And, and this year, like last year, I'm going to lose weight. <laughs> I didn't lose weight last year, but I tried for the first month. And it got hard. But this year, this year I'm doing it. I'm losing 50 pounds this year if i got to amputate a limb. <laughs> I'm doing it. Um, maybe. I don't know. I might get bored with it and just quit. We'll see. But we all do things that, that, that make us better. We do things that, that build us up and make us you know, thinner or, or smarter or stronger. You know, read the Bible more. Uh, stop yelling at my husband so much. Uh, <laughs> things like that. And, and we don't really do things uh, really, you know, I'm, I'm not going around saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drink more Coca-Cola. I'm going to eat more food with high fructose corn syrup in it. That's what I want to do. I want to strive to be, you know, 300 pounds. That's, no, we all do things that uh, make us better. And most people make resolutions, and most people uh, do this to some degree or another. Um, maybe you're not, you know, as ambitious as me losing you know, 50 pounds, but, I mean, let's be honest, I'm not going to do it anyway. <laughs> uh, but with those new beginnings, with the, that blank slate, uh, that comes with a whole mess of new problems that's going to come up that are just, you know, specific to 2020. Uh, going to war with Iran. Uh, stuff like that, you know, just the, the fun stuff. Going to war with Iran. Uh, but that's it's what's good that we try to build ourselves up and make ourselves better at the beginning of the new year. And uh, the people that we bring around us are the people who are going to help us in those hard times, in those difficult days that are ahead. Um, They're going to either make your year easier or they're going to make your year harder, depending on who you bring in to influence your life. Because the people that we interact with, the people that we bring in into our community that we're close with, uh, those are the ones who are going to influence our life the most. They are going to influence our lives more than you can imagine. The, the people who you uh, 
care about, that you spend time with. And, uh, I mean, people are going to influence your attitude. They're going to influence your ambition. They're going to influence your spirituality. If you don't think that people influence you in a positive or negative way, just spend five minutes with somebody with a bad attitude. Spend five minutes with somebody with a bad attitude, and you'll walk away with a bad attitude. Uh, I've got these two guys I used to work with on the railroad. One guy was just this old man. He was crotchety. He was, he was just nonstop, sourpuss, just hated life. And we, at one time, we were going to a trip, and you know, you'd spend 12 hours on a train with this guy, and you're just miserable because he's miserable. I mean, it could be raining money, and he would just he'd find the bad in it. We didn't need to rain. We could make the best trip in the history of the railroad, the history of anything. Fastest trip ever. We get there and, you know, he's like, well, I, just, I wanted the overtime. I didn't want a fast trip. This isn't going to work. Boss come out and be like, you just made the fastest trip in the history of the railroad. Here's a $100 bill. Man, my taxes are just going to go up. $100 bill. <laughs> Gosh. He was, he was miserable about Everything. I'm not going to do this $100. Go to dinner. Service will be bad. Food won't come out when I wanted it. Yeah. And spending all that time with him, you develop, you know, you start mirroring his attitude. I worked with this other guy who, this is a true story. You're not going to believe me, but it is. We got a $50 gift card to the BNSF store. So you got a $50 gift card, but you had to use it at the BNSF store. And the BNSF store had like hoodies and stuff like that with logos on it and pins and a bunch of different stuff. But you had to use it at the BNSF store. And he was insulted that they would give him free money that he had to use at this store. So insulted that he said, I'm going to get them back. I'm going to buy a tube of chapstick, one tube of chapstick, Every week, once a week, until I run out this $50 gift card. Just to show them, why would you dare give me money? And BNSF would pay for the shipping. So he says, you know what? I'm going to overnight it. Just so they got to pay more. And not, you know, for giving me free money. He was that, I mean, he was that guy. But you spend time with these people, and by the end of the trip, you know, 12-hour trip with this guy, I'm like, they really, why would they do that to us? Why would, I'm a pretty happy-go-lucky guy. I don't, you know, get worked up about a lot of stuff. I'm like, why, why would they give us a gift card? Why are we having such a good trip? How dare they? Oh, my gosh. Oh, God. And we're, by the end of the trip, I'm even more mad than they are because... One, I spent, you know, the whole day with the same scenario as they were. And two, I had to listen to them complain the entire trip. So people around you are going to influence you, uh, whether it's good or bad. And uh, the people around you are your greatest influencers. And we can see this in our walk with Christ. And the people who influence us to be better Christians, to uh, read our Bible more, influence us to want to be better husbands, better fathers, better children. Uh, if you have great people around you, you're gonna, they're going to influence you greatly. If you have strong prayer warriors or, or uh, people who are examples of Christ, they're going to influence you to become you know, better prayers and better uh, examples of Christ in your life. And you can see uh, the way that people influence uh, us and the in the story of David. David is, was the second king of Israel. And most of David's accomplishments were done with the help of his friends. He killed Goliath by himself. After that, most of the things he's done, he did with these strong, loyal men around him. And he did amazing things. Uh, he, he was probably my favorite person in the Bible, hands down. I like history, and I like uh, that type of 
you know, swords and battles and stuff like that, kings and I'm a nerd. Uh, I like that kind of stuff. So David's story really spoke to me. And this got this overall, over this huge story of David. And it is just an awesome read. Uh, but he was a flawed man. He was an incredible, incredible person. But he was a flawed man. It makes him more relatable to people. Um, he's the guy who brought together the 12 tribes of Israel. Saul really got it started, but David's the one who brought together these, this loose confederation of tribes and brought it into one nation. David was described as being a man after God's own heart. I've been called some things in my life. Uh, David, you know, being a man after God's own heart is not the worst thing I've been called. It is a, a, one of the most, probably the best uh, compliments that somebody can receive, being, being somebody after God's own heart. That's an amazing, amazing compliment. Uh, but that was David. And, and David lives this life with these people around him that are building him up. So after David, uh, he kills Goliath. Uh, the, the current king becomes jealous. And of all the things that David is doing, he becomes jealous. And uh, he starts sending him on suicide missions. And these suicide missions are only accomplished because of the people that David had around him. And not only did David, you know, just merely, you know, I got it done. He didn't just get the job done. He flourished during this time. He, Saul would send him out on a, on a mission to bring a hundred, you know, kill a hundred men and come back. So David and his men would go and kill 200 and come back. And these suicide missions are the only way he could get through them was because of the men, the loyal men that he had around him. And at some point, Saul finally, he loses it. He, you know, he's been trying to kill him the old-fashioned, or, you know, the subtle way. He says, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to do it myself. He throws a spear at him, and David kind of goes on the run, and he's a mercenary for 10 years, and he's building up this mercenary company around him, and uh, he builds this army of men around him that are uh, the fiercest fighters, you know, in the Old Testament. And he he, had already earned his reputation as a fighter. Now he's earning his reputation as a general and as a a captain. And uh, every man in his, you know, army was just awesome. But he had these 30 close men who were in community with him that he brought in close, that were his inner circle, that were just, you know, the best of the best. Um, they would do anything for him. Anything. There was one guy who, everybody else fell back. Everybody else retreated back. Uh, he stood there with a sword in his hand and fought until he was done. And while, when he was done, he had killed many men. And he couldn't release the sword out of his hand because his hands were spasming so much. And he couldn't let go of the sword. The Bible says it was frozen to his hand. It was a guy who killed 300 men with a spear. Uh, One man, Benaiah, killed a a seven-and-a-half-foot Egyptian with his own spear. Took the spear away from a a seven-and-a-half-foot tall dude and stabbed him with it. These are bad guys. Uh... Benaiah also, he's the guy who jumps in a a pit with a lion just to kill a lion, just to be the guy, just to have that under his belt, be a lion killer. Uh, And Benaiah was with him, David, the longest. Of all the people in David's life, Benaiah was there through thick and thin. He was there when David was on his deathbed. He was there with his David's son after David had died, uh, heading up their armies. Benaiah was there loyal to David from the beginning to the end. Uh, three of these other men, they, one time they heard David saying, hey, you know, I, I just want some, some water from Bethlehem. There's a well outside of Bethlehem. It's just, just a great well. And I just want water from that well. He was homesick. And he wanted something from home. He wanted a drink from a well at home. And he was reminiscing and I live, used to live in California. Who else has lived somewhere else, not in the Oklahoma? Not somewhere around here. I 
lived in California, which is just a super weird place. Uh, I lived in Southern California, which was even more weird. Uh, the, the weirdest part about it was there was no quick trips and there was no Sonics. It was, it was ridiculous what it was. But there was a Sonic. We lived in San Diego, and there was a Sonic in Anaheim. So if we wanted Sonic, we would have to drive three hours to go get it. But the, the real slap in the face, they would still show commercials for Sonic. So I'd be watching TV, and I'd see, oh, that's a cherry limeade and the mozzarella sticks and a big coney with chili. And, and I'd be like, oh, yeah, be, my mouth would be water. And I'm like, that's, it, just, and it would say Sonic. And I'm like, oh, get in the car. We're going to Sonic. <laughs> We're driving to Anaheim. No, it was, it, was a, it, was a, it was infuriating is what it was. I'm not bitter at all. But one time, a friend and I, we were working together, and we were delivering ammunition to a place in Yuma, Arizona, uh, another beautiful, beautiful place. If you've ever been to Yuma, I apologize. Um, and we were, he was around here from here somewhere, a place with Quick Trip, because we started reminiscing about Quick Trip. Oh, Quick Trip. They had the best everything. You'd go in and you'd see the fountain drinks lined up over there and any kind of drink you want. You go into the bathroom, the bathroom's clean. You walk through there, you know, feet aren't sticking to the floor. <laughs> oh, man, come out and they got the hot dogs on the rollers. Go pay for it and the clerk's nice, well dressed, shirt tucked in. This is this is God's convenience store. <laughs> This is the chosen convenience store. It's, it's beautiful, is what it is. Well, we started talking about it. And, you know, he's like, could you just imagine having a drink from Quick Trip? And like, like when, you, when you're on those long drives and you, you're driving and you see, a, you know, off in the distance, a Quick Trip sign come up over the horizon. <laughs> like, that's it. It's beautiful. I might cry. <laughs> Last week, Cody was talking about his son. He was up here tearing up, and I'm talking about Quick Trip. I'm going to tear up. <laughs> you see where my, my head's at. Uh, but that's what David was doing. He was just reminiscing about this, uh, the, the Old Testament equivalent of a big Q, a Dr. Pepper, Easy Ice, big Q drink. And he was reminiscing. He was just like, oh, that's all I want. So three of his men go through enemy territory to Bethlehem and get him a cup of water. Bethlehem was surrounded by an army of Philistines. And they were like, David wants a drink. We're getting him a drink. That's how loyal every man was to David. They loved David. And they were there to build him up. And all of his accomplishments and all of his amazing deeds were there because they were so loyal. And because they loved him so much. Uh, but I want to talk about, there's two people that I really want to talk about. Uh, that were with David, that built him up. And they're not, you know, they're famous for their deeds, but they're also famous for being friends and uh, sticking by David no matter what. Uh, because we need friends like this. We need uh, the people who are going to be by us. And not only do we need those friends, we need to be those friends. Uh, the people that make us stronger and better, we should be making them stronger and better as well. Uh, the first guy is Jonathan. Jonathan was the king, the son of the king. He was the prince of Israel. Uh, Saul was his father. And from the very beginning, Jonathan was there when David killed Goliath. And from, from that point, it was, it was bros at first sight. They, they, they were best friends from that point. And Jonathan even gives David his armor as a sign of respect for the things that he'd done. He'd, Take my own armor, the prince's armor. Uh, they even become brother-in-law when, they, when David marries into the family. He marries Jonathan's sister. Uh, but all that fame and all that fortune, all the amazing things that David did, all the uh, battles that he won, the victories, and all the people that started following him, 
posed a problem for Jonathan because Jonathan was the person who's supposed to take over as king. He was the prince. But he wasn't going to let that stand, you know, in, in between him and David. Uh, David was the anointed next king of Israel. And uh, technically that's where Jonathan should be. But Jonathan was loyal even though me personally, if I had a chance to be king, I would step over my best friend and push him in the ground. Sorry, buddy. I'm going to be king. I want a crown. I want people to, I get to tell what to do. That's, maybe, maybe y'all aren't like that. You're looking at me really judgmentally. <laughs> I'm sorry. Everybody else in this room is so great, and I'm the only one who would, who would be king. I'd be fine, because I'm king. Doesn't matter. But he has every reason not to support David, but he does it anyway. Not just because they're, you know, best friends, but because that's, the rightful place of David. That's the right thing to do. So Jonathan was going to do it because it was the right thing to do. Uh, Saul comes to, to Jonathan and says, Hey, listen, man, you, you can't do this. You can't keep hiding David from me. I'm going to find him. I'm going to kill him. Uh, and 1 Samuel 20, 31 says, Every day Jesse's son lives on earth. You and your kingship are not secure. Now send for him and bring him to me. He must die. Saul says, you can be the second king in the history of Israel. Being king isn't a bad gig. You have as many wives as you want. You know, lots of money. People just do what you say. It's amazing. But you can't do it. You can't be king while David's alive. He's got to die. But Jonathan, he's, he's, he wouldn't budge. He was going to stand by David no matter what. He wasn't going to give him up because it was the right thing to do. And that's what a friend is. A friend is somebody who does something for you, will have your back even, even when it costs them something. They're going to do the right thing no matter what. The second person was Joab. Joab was the general of all of David's armies when uh, David becomes king. And this is the friend that you, you want sometimes. He's the, he's the blunt guy. He's the guy who's going to tell it how it is. He's the guy who uh, is going to do whatever he thinks is needed. He's going to do it if, it's, if he thinks it's for your good. He's going to do it. Whether you want him to or not, he's going to do it. Uh, like Lindsay. Lindsay has, you know... She told me not to say this again. I said it in the first service. She said, don't say that. Lindsay comes to me and says, hey, to be nice, not to be mean, you're getting a little chubby. <laughs> she says it with her sweet voice. She says it like, not to, not to be mean. You can't just say whatever you want and they say not to be mean before it. <laughs> It's not a nice, I didn't want to hear it. I didn't, it's a, not a nice thing to say, but it was something that probably should have been said. Yeah, she was in the right, I guess. But Joab was this person. He was the person who's going to tell you, you know, he was going to hold you accountable. Uh, he thought, thought David needed something done. He was going to do it, no questions asked, even to the point of killing his own men. Uh, when David's, one of David's son rebels and takes the throne from him and like moves into his castle and tries to have David killed. David goes on the run and Joab is the one who takes care of it. He kills David's son just to protect David. And while David's mourning his son, because that's what, I mean, a father would do. He's mourning his son because even though he did all this bad stuff to him and he, you know, tried to kill him and took over his kingdom, basically. He was still a son. But all of his armies, all of David's armies see this, see David mourning his son. They don't see him as a son, they see him as a traitor, somebody who tried to kill him. So they feel like they're being neglected over 
a traitor. And they become restless. And then Joab, who's the friend that we only want sometimes. He, he's the friend who, you know, we would just, you know, we like having him, but we don't like him talking. Uh, he comes and has the hard conversation with David. He's the one who comes and says, hey, you need to knock it off. In 2 Samuel 19, uh, verse 5, it says, Then Joab went to the house of the king and said, Today you have shamed all your soldiers, those who saved your life as well as your sons, your wives, and your concubines. By loving your enemies and hating those who love you, today you have made it clear that the commanders and the soldiers mean nothing to you. In fact, today I know that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead, it would be fine with you. Now get up, go out, and encourage your soldiers, for I swear by the Lord that if you don't go out, not a man will remain with you tonight. This will be worse for you than all the trouble that has come to you from your youth until now. Hey, remember, he's talking to a king. He's talking to a man who has the utmost authority anywhere around. This is the guy who can say, well, you're fired now. Talk to me like that. Go home. He also could say, hey, bring some guards in here. Take him and out back and beat him. But Joab didn't come to him as a king and a general. He came to him as two friends when he saw an error that his friend was making. And that's what we need. We need people who hold us accountable. We need people who push us to be better and don't let us slide on stuff when they know it's going to hurt us. We know that David built all this stuff around him, these great things, and he was going to throw it away for basically a traitor. They're not afraid to have these difficult conversations. I've been on both ends of these difficult conversations. I've been the guy who had to take a deep breath and go tell somebody, a friend of mine, that, hey, I'm not coming to you as, you know, a boss or a leader. I'm coming to you as a friend. But you need to, you know, straighten up and fly right. You need to knock it off. Uh, and I've been on the other end of the conversation, which is m even more awkward. Uh, I've had people come to me and say, you know, TJ, what are you doing, buddy? Uh, I joined the Marine Corps at 18. Uh, I went from, you know, small town TJ to joining an environment where it was perfectly acceptable to start drinking at 10 a.m. Um, not like mimosas with brunch. I'm talking professional drinking. Uh, I wasn't naive to the whole drinking thing when I, you know, joined the Marine Corps. But I went from, you know, high school house parties to uh, the big leagues overnight. And... You know, everybody, everybody drank. And I, you know, I took to it like a fish to water. Um, and it was great. It was fun. Until, you know, I started coming into work and more and more smelling like alcohol. And then, you know, somebody had to have that hard conversation with me. Say, hey, we can't keep hiding you for the first two hours of the work day. Because people are starting to notice. So I had to make a decision because what I was doing wasn't right, and I knew it. And he had to make that, have to have that conversation because he knew what I was doing wasn't right. And even if we left, we parted as not friends anymore. Even if we did that, he was still going to do it because it was for my own good. And that's what we need to have around us, and that's what we need to be for other people. Uh, people who hold us accountable, friends who push each other to be better, to be stronger, to be better uh, Christ followers. Uh, I used to hate going to lunch with Johnny. Because he'd call, this was years ago, and he'd call, Are you going to lunch? Sure. And then I'd go get my Bible and start reading real quick. Because I knew at some point during lunch, he would say, How's your quiet time been? I haven't had one in a week. What do you mean? How's your quiet time been? How's your family? How's your, you know, spiritual life? How are you leading your family? 
How's your wife's spiritual life? What's your wife's quiet time like? Bro, I just want some food <laughs> and to go home. We'll hang out. We'll talk. You know, shoot the breeze. And we'll go home. I don't want deep conversations. Gosh, I want buffalo wild wings. But he was holding me accountable. He was making sure that I was living the life that I should have been living, of being the man and the father and the husband that I should have been. Uh, And that's what Joab was doing to David. He wasn't going to let him slack because they were friends, and he cared about them. This is what you need to ask yourself. Am I being that friend? Am I being the friend that people can count on? Uh, Am I being the friend that I need to be? Because it's not a one-way street. It shouldn't be, you know, just expecting people to be loyal and expecting people to push you. Uh, It should be you pushing people and you being loyal to people. If you want a friend like that, then you need to be a friend like that. If you want a friend who holds you accountable, you need to be a friend that holds people accountable. If you want a friend that, you know, prays for you, you need to be a friend that prays for your friends. You won't grow spiritually unless you, you have that, that spiritual example in front of you. People in your life who hold you accountable. I grew up in a church, and uh, I was there every Sunday. If the doors were open, I was there. I had to. I was forced. Uh, my grandpa was the, the pastor, and most of the people in the church were called well. So I had no choice but to go. Um. But I knew you know, like all the stuff. I knew the important scriptures. I knew I, knew I was saved. I knew the, all the songs and the stories. And you know, Father Abraham had me and his son. Uh, I knew that kind of stuff. And I was, you know, semi-firm in my beliefs. But I didn't know how to grow further than that. Uh, I was at a plateau. And I had, you know, amazing spiritual leaders. But they were all, you know, 50 years my senior and I never really started growing until I joined a small group. Until I, brought in, I went to a community of people, like-minded people who wanted better for me. I learned how to be a better husband, better father. I learned how to study the Word of God. I learned how to uh, witness to people. And I didn't do it. I didn't learn those things listening to a preacher at a pulpit. Um, because I know I'm... I know it's shocking. I know how handsome I am. I know how articulate I am. And I know, you know, how funny I am. Uh, but all those things. And Johnny is an amazing pastor. And he, he comes week in, week out, and gives these amazing, amazing sermons that, you know, are life-changing. And he's the best thing ever. And he, he signs my paychecks now. So he's the best, probably the best preacher I've ever heard in my life. And then, like, Cody. Cody, last week, just brought down the house. And it was amazing. But all these people, all me, Johnny, Cody, if you're counting on Johnny to to push you to be where you need to be, if you're counting on Johnny to do everything for you, you're missing out. Uh, You will grow. You will grow by listening to him, but you will not grow to the full potential. You cannot grow to the full potential. Uh, Paul Washer is a pastor. uh, He's a very blunt person. If you've ever heard him speak, he's a uh, very in-your-face, Joab-type person. He, uh, He said this about, he said it about children, but it applies here as well. He says, your children will go to public schools and will be the, will be trained for somewhere around 15,000 hours in ungodly and secular thought. And they'll go to Sunday school and color a picture of Noah's Ark. And you think that's going to stand against the lies that they are being told. The same thing applies to us. If we go work a 40-hour work week, and the only other time that we spend in community with other believers is for an hour on Sunday, you, are, you cannot grow to your full potential. You cannot. It is impossible. So here's the sales pitch. Here's the timeshare pitch at the end of the fun weekend. You need to join a small group. And we're starting small groups back up. And I'm not just saying this so I look better because I lead that area of ministry. But you need 
for your own good to join a small group. You have to have a community of believers around you to build you up. Uh, we should be a community that carries each other's burdens. Uh, so we can take those burdens off of each other and make others' lives easier. Uh, you heard the, heard the quote, If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. We need people to make those burdens lighter so that we can go further. Galatians 6.2 says, Carry one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? What is the law of Christ? John 13.34 says, I give you a new command. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. So we fulfill the law of Christ by making life more bearable for others, by showing them love and living in community with them. That's how we fulfill the law of Christ. And when it comes down to it, we should be living our lives like Jesus lived his life. And there isn't a better example than someone carrying somebody else's burdens than God sending his son to die for us. Sending his son to die for our sins. We've got to carry our burdens the for our friends, and the way that Christ did it for us. That means while we're still sinners, while we're imperfect, our friends are caring for us. And Christ cared for us. Even in our ignorance, Christ died for us. Without expecting anything in return, Christ died for us. And that's what we should be doing for our friends. Let's pray together.